In general, I consider technology to be my friend, but this book has me thinking twice. It's called The Future of Violence, Robots and Germs, Hackers and Drones Confronting a New Age of Threat. One of the co-authors, Gabriella Bloom, joins me now. She's also a professor of international law and human rights at Harvard Law School. Gabby, it's good to meet you. You know, congratulate. if your goal was to scare the hell out of the reader, you <laughs> succeeded. Let me say what I think is your thesis. States and governments uh, can cause mayhem, weapons of mass destruction, that kind of thing. But you use the term technologies of mass empowerment are now in the hands of real people who can do comparable kind of damage. That's essentially where you're going, right? That's exactly right. So give us some examples of things that probably would scare us most, that are most real or imminently on the horizon. So imagine you walk into your shower and you find a spider. And that spider can be real or that spider can be a drone. And that drone can have surveillance capabilities and it could have lethal capabilities. And all you need is basically an iPhone to operate that drone from either a sports bar down the road or another country. And that's a technology that we used to think of as in the province of governments. We talk about targeted killings, Somalia, Yemen. All of a sudden, it's a technology that you and I can have, and that's mass empowerment. Now, now. Well, those kinds you cannot yet. That's in the, on the horizon for about, I would say, 10 years. Uh, but certainly you and I can go online and purchase drones. You can even go and build one. There is a website that tells you how to do it if you're looking for a weekend hobby. And some of them come already mounted with cameras. And then adding a lethal capability is not that difficult. So when you say lethal, so that, again, it could be a real spider. It could be taking your picture and then putting it on the internet. That's right. Or it could be assassinating you. Exactly right. Okay, so virtually every time I read about some kid who's a hacker in Asia who is bringing down a major company or the Pentagon or whatever, I say to somebody who's on our radio show, Boston Public Radio, why can't that same kid bring down a plane? And they say, well, the safeguards are all there. Are they there? Why can't some incredibly competent hacker bring down an airplane? I think it's something to worry about. So there are two kinds of worries here. First of all, we just saw on a JFK airport drones circling around and endangering planes. Now, those are not planning to bring down the plane as far as we know, but the fact that they're there are, is dangerous mm -hmm. enough. In addition, I mean, just like a bird has brought down it's some like a planes. bird yeah, yeah. that is going to interfere with civil mm -hmm. aviation with potentially catastrophic outcomes, as in terrorism. It wouldn't be any different in terms of the outcome. We also see now the ability to hack into car systems, for instance. Uh, Wired magazine just published a great story showing uh, two hackers with computers hacking into a Jeep. Uh, vehicle and taking over that Jeep, the now, car, now. right now, right now. And if you can do it with the car, it may be more, takes a little more sophistication with other transportation means, but it doesn't seem that kind of belief. How about water supplies? What ability is there right now to fly a drone over some reservoir and essentially drop some chemical or bio something in it that could poison a whole population. Is That's that exactly real? what we were worried about, yes. So if you look at all these technologies taken together, you look at drones, you look at internet, cyber, you look at uh, synthetic biology, What's part of the thing that's uh, scary about them is how they work in combination, the synergy. And it's exactly the scenario you're describing of operating one of these things remotely and using it to spread. So why has that happened? I mean, if all, there, these, I mean, there are endless possibilities, each of which are equally terrifying, some 10 years away, some uh, uh, able to be done right now. Why hasn't it happened? So one possibility is that human nature isn't as bad as... Uh, but it is. I mean, it is. So I'm scared that it is. And it doesn't take... Most people, by the way, are going to use technology only for the noblest and Well, I mean, if a kid purposes. goes in and kills nine black people in Charleston, one would assume if he or a person like him had the technological skills you describe, he or she could do the same kind of damage on a far grander scale. I'm yes? worried exactly about that. And I'm also worried that different kinds of modes of violence invite different people to join them, so it may take a different kind of person to shoot a gun at someone and a different kind of person to click a mouse or a keyboard. Sitting in their bedroom and exactly, their underwear. Exactly, and doing it through a mediated You know, the technology. only thing that scares me almost as much as some of these possibilities is what I think is your solution, which is that you, you write that, that you and your co-author that security and liberty are not mutually exclusive, that essentially, uh, I used the term before you may not like, that essentially that we have to beef up Big Brother mm -hmm. to protect us from all these little brothers. We just live through this situation where we're trying to scale back what is being done to us allegedly in the name of security, the NSA and all the things Snowden told us about. So why should we trust the government enough and give them more power in theory to protect us from these things that you're 
talking about. So the question is, at the end of the day, who do you fear more? There are reasons to fear the government. There are reasons to fear all those little brothers out there. And people have the sensibility that the virtual world is virtual. It's where your thoughts are, mm -hmm. and they should be free and, and, and from any regulation or intervention. But the virtual world is now a very physical, real world. It's where your relationships are, your transactions, your financial, your medical history, everything about you. And just as you don't want to walk around on the streets with no police force, you don't want to be in any virtual world or technological world with no policing powers. Fair enough, I'm sort of convinced. <laughs> Gabriella Bloom, thank you so much. The future of violence, robots and germs, hackers and drones.